Welcome to all of you to Vivek Murthy Distinguished Lecture Series on Public Health Leadership. Uh, this lecture series is in celebration of the Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month uh, from National Institute of Health, from the Federal Asian Pacific American Council, which is known as PAYPAC, uh, from the HHS, and other agencies like FDA, CDC, HRSA, APOC. My name is Rena Das. I'm a division director at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. So we know that health of population in the world is ultimately dependent upon the success of our public health response, particularly our public health leaders at the local, state, national, and international level. Today's event is incredibly meaningful to the AA and NHPI community because today we have the, with us the U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy and Mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, two great public health leaders to inspire our next generation. So to start us off this event, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable, Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, who will provide with some welcome remarks and share some of his thoughts to kick off this great, exciting event. Dr. Perez Estable, take it away. Thank you, Rina. Um... And uh, welcome everyone. My name is Eliseo Perez Estable and I'm the director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And it, it is, I'm really proud of our sponsorship of this second annual Vivek Muti lecture event in celebration of Asian Heritage Month. So, and I'm really especially proud that uh, Michelle Wu agreed to, uh, to join us today in this conversation. Uh, as you heard, May is Asian uh, Pacific Islander American Heritage Month, a celebration of Asian Americans, uh, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders in the United States. The goal of the Vivek H. Murthy Distinguished Lecture Series on Public Health Leadership is to recognize a public health leader whose enduring efforts have made a significant impact on advancing public health. At the first meeting, uh, Dr. Murti uh, recognized Dr. Victor Zhao, and today we have the honor of, uh, of having um, Michelle Wu, the mayor of Boston, uh, attendance. So uh, we are expanding our horizons at NIH by including uh, a, 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 the mayor of a major city in the United States. Uh, the goal is for this to continue on an annual basis, uh, and it is really consistent with NIH's effort on addressing health equity. Um, in the past two years, uh, we've lived through uh, an especially stressful time with the pandemic. Um, in a, a small group conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago, someone commented when the pandemic came, uh, there was this big firestorm and NIH ran to the fire to see what we could do. Um, and I think that captures the sense of what, what we felt all felt in 2020. Uh, two years later, uh, it's not over, uh, but we certainly have a much better understanding on what the issues are and what we need to do. And what we learned about addressing health equity, about addressing structural racism and discrimination has really something that we can extend to many other parts of our efforts and our work. Um, uh, today, uh, Dr. Murthy and uh, Ms. Wu will discuss uh, personal reflections on various topics, uh, guided by our fantastic moderator. Uh, and so we look forward to the conversation between these two leaders. Um, so uh, I will pass it on to uh, the deputy director of NIMHD, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, who's been uh, with us for a little over two years and just uh, side by side in all of the, and addressing all these issues over this time. Monica? Thank you, Dr. Perez Stavli, and welcome everyone. I am delighted to and honored to moderate the second year of this event. The format of the Vivek H. Murthy Distinguished Lecture Series for Public Health Leadership is a, a virtual conversation or a fireside chat 
rather than a, a lecture or a formal presentation. We have the privilege of hearing from two amazing, fascinating guests. And I think that this is a great opportunity and perhaps even more interesting to have a more informal conversation that will allow us to learn about these distinguished individuals in a different way, to hear their personal reflections on past and current events, and to allow us to incorporate questions from the audience. So you have heard a little bit about our distinguished guests already, but allow me to introduce our guests by sharing just a little bit more, a small selection of their not only impressive, but historic careers. Dr. Vivek H. Murthy is the 21st Surgeon General of the United States as a returning role, previously serving as the 19th Surgeon General. As the nation's doctor, the Surgeon General's mission is to restore trust by relying on the best scientific information available, providing clear, consistent guidance and resources for the public, and ensuring that we reach our most vulnerable communities. As the Vice Admiral of the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps, Dr. Murthy commands a uniformed service of 6,000 dedicated public health officers serving the most underserved and vulnerable populations domestically and abroad. And our honoree today, Mayor Michelle Wu is the Mayor of Boston. Mayor Wu graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Law School. She was first elected to the Boston City Council in November 2013, and in January 2016, she was elected president of the City Council, becoming the first woman of color to serve on the council. And as a counselor, Mayor Wu was the lead sponsor of Boston's paid parental leave ordinance and a healthcare equity ordinance prohibiting discrimination based on gender identity. She also authored Boston's Communications Access Ordinance, which guarantees translation, interpretation, and assistive technology access to city services, regardless of English language proficiency or communications disability. Mayor Wu has been a voice for accessibility, transparency, and community engagement in city leadership. She has a background in community advocacy as well, having worked at the Wilmer Hale Legal Services Center in Jamaica Plain, providing legal advice to low income small business owners, as well as at the Medical Legal Partnership at Boston Medical Center on immigration law cases for survivors of domestic violence. In 2016, the then Counselor Wu was honored as one of the 10 outstanding young leaders by the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and as part of the Marie Claire Magazine's New Guard, the 50 Most Influential Women in America. She was elected mayor of Boston in 2021. And as mayor, she is working in coalition to deliver bold, systematic change and make Boston a city for everyone. And a couple of additional notes, Mayor Wu is fluent in Mandarin and Spanish and lives with her husband and her two sons. So Dr. Murthy, it is great to see you again. And Mayor Wu, congratulations on being elected mayor of Boston. That's fantastic and hugely important for many reasons. And I look forward to this, this fireside chat with, with both of you. So let's move directly into the conversation. We are celebrating Asian Pacific Islander, uh, Pacific American heritage this month. And it would be great to hear your reflections and personal experiences that help shape who you are particularly as part of the U.S. Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community in the U.S. So Dr. Murthy, may I ask you to share a little bit with us? I was actually going to suggest since um, Mayor Wu is our guest of honor, would you be okay if we started with her? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I am thrilled and deeply humbled to be here. And um, I think we'll be popcorning back and forth anyway, but really, really uh, appreciate your gracious welcome. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who's tuning in. I am a little over 160 days into my new job as mayor of Boston and uh, still in the immigrant family that I grew up in, the ultimate hope was for me to be a doctor. So uh, Dr. Murthy is still the embodiment of my parents' dreams. <laughs> I still get questions like, when are you, when are you stopping that politics thing? Um, so for me, this month is, is special, uh, but it took me a long time to really have a, a sense of ease and um, grounding in what being an Asian American meant. 
so much in my childhood, I understand those terms and labels as two separate identities. And it really felt as if at home, where we only spoke Mandarin, where we ate dinner with chopsticks every night, uh, where my parents took a while to become more comfortable with English, at home versus in school, where I learned very quickly what foods not to bring to school so I wouldn't be bullied and, and things like that, that um, I often was navigating two different worlds and trying to be a bridge or trying to pass and um, be able to flow in, in multiple spaces. And that sense of not quite belonging has always been part of my existence. Uh, I think it coming again from an immigrant family where there were language barriers, um, even before my mom's later diagnosis of serious mental health challenges, there was a sense of what spaces were built for us, what systems didn't see us, frankly. And so May is um, not only a time to lift up the complexity of that identity, it's also Mental Health Awareness Month. And for me, that carries a special significance because I'm only here in this role having seen firsthand the challenges and the struggles that so many families experience and the extra burdens then with language and cultural barriers that I am working to, to fight every day to make sure that the experiences that I bring from outside government are what we work on and remember and, and are opening ourselves up to within government as well. Thank you for that. Um, I think many people can resonate with, with what you're saying. Um, Dr. Murphy, as you reflect on this question, what are key experiences that stand out from, from your life and background that motivated you to seek public services part of your career journey. Actually, first, let me just say how excited I am that Michelle and Mayor Wu is here with us and uh, that you agreed to be our guest. Um, you know, I don't mean to embarrass you, but you know, you have been such a hero to so many uh, people in the AAPI community and beyond. And I still remember the night that you were elected. Uh, my wife, who's uh, Chinese American, was incredibly excited as was I. And I remember we told our kids uh, who are, you know, two Asian American kids who are four and five and we're going to grow up navigating a world where they sometimes feel like they belong and sometimes feel like they don't. And to see someone like you, Michelle, who looks so much like my own two children, uh, you know, be elected to that, to such a prominent office in our country, uh, you know, I want them to be able to look at people like you and say, hey, you know, maybe there's a place for me, uh, you know, in leadership, maybe there's a place for me in public service. So uh, I just want you to know how much that meant uh, to me personally and to so many of us. I know I'm not alone. Um, you know, for, for me, a lot of the stories you, uh, Michelle shared are actually similar to mine. And I grew up in a family that had a very strong sense of identity. My family is originally from India. And uh, I grew up with customs and traditions and food from, uh, from India. And um, that was like a very core part of my identity. But when I left home and when I was in school, you know, during the day, it wasn't always clear to me how much that identity fit in. And, uh, and then many times it felt like it didn't. Uh, so I still remember experiences of bringing food uh, to uh, school and then, uh, you know, other kids saying, what is that? That's really weird. Ew, like that's gross. Da, da, da. And um, it's because they weren't familiar with it. I don't blame, you know, I don't blame them. They were, we were all in elementary school at the time, but it sort of created this uh, hesitancy, you know, for, uh, on my side about sort of bringing who I was at home and that other part of my identity to school. And even though I didn't shy away from it, it was, you know, it made me anxious at times. And I, I wasn't quite sure uh, if all of me was actually accepted. So there was that quest to find uh, where I really belonged, you know, recognizing that I wasn't going to give up my, uh, you know, my Asian American identity, but I was struggling to find a place where it truly fit. And over time, you know, I, I was grateful to meet people who I mean, understood and appreciated that part of me. And I, you know, came to learn more and more about other cultures and traditions and see some many, many of the common threads that exist between our traditions, even though we may eat different food and wear different clothes. Um, so that helped over time. But I do think that when you've been an outsider, um, that feeling of being an outsider never truly uh, leaves your memory, you know? So even though I feel much more like I belong now in the United States, there are certainly moments where I experience racism and uh, and I know many, I'm not alone in that, in that regard. And in those moments, uh, sometimes you make us wonder, huh, uh, do I really belong here? Um, the answer I always come back to is yes, but um, you know, we're all living in a reality where it doesn't always feel that way. Uh, and, and I'll lastly say that, you know, in terms of public service, um, when I was in ninth grade, I remember uh, I was in world history class and I love world history and my teacher knew I love world history. And at the end of the, one of the classes, she pulled me over and she said, you know, Vivek, 
I can tell you really like this stuff. Maybe one day you could be Secretary of State. Uh, and I remember coming home to my mom and saying, Mama, Miss Bryce thinks that maybe I could be Secretary of State one day. My mom was really alarmed. She called my father. She said, you need to talk to him. He's thinking about going into politics. <laughs> and it was just an emblematic of the, um, the stigma, really, associated with working in government because my parents came from a, uh, you know, a place in time when there was a lot of corruption in, in government and they didn't want uh, their children to be a part of that. Um, and so it's been a journey, not just for me, you know, to make my way from school into the you know career of medicine to sort of building tech companies and being an entrepreneur to doing advocacy and, and then ultimately ending up in, in, in public service. Uh, it's been, but it's also been a journey for my family. And I think I've come to appreciate, you know, as I've grown up, how my parents have also had to shift and evolve and change a lot in, in their own views. And I think as a child, I didn't fully appreciate just how profound the changes that they were navigating and the delta between where they started their lives. My dad in particular in a small farming village in India where he had um, you know, very, very little resources, barely enough food to eat each day to actually having a home and being able to raise a family in the United States. That is such a massive delta that I probably will, I will never be able to achieve in my life just because I was privileged to start at a different place. Um, but I'm grateful to have this chance to serve. And whenever I, uh, usually something happens at least once a day in this role where I think, gosh, I, I'm so fortunate to have the chance to be able to serve, and I hope I do it justice, you know, by uh, making a contribution to people's lives. But I'm also reminded that for all of us who have the privilege of being able to serve, um, that, you know, we have to open doors uh, for others uh, in the community and make sure that ultimately the government that we are part of represents uh, the people that it's seeking to serve and looks like the people it's seeking to serve. Thank you. You know, you both have just amazing careers that have, have really made history. And in listening to you talk, um, I do hear the, common, the commonality in the stories that you shared. And Dr. Murthy, one of the things that you said that stands out with me was sort of this quest to find out where you belong. And I heard many reflections that, um, that Mayor Wu shared with us that are along that same line and how you both you know, really evolved. And I think it's important for people to think about how they can integrate their identities and bring their authentic selves to their job, their career. And I imagine that in, in both of your building of such esteemed careers as public health leaders and, and public servants, that you had many challenges along the way to building your career specifically. Meru, would you share a few key, re key reflections on your career path and how you navigated to the current point in your journey? And, and with that, some of the career challenges that you've had to overcome along the way? In some ways, it is um, incredibly powerful and affirming that every election cycle and every year here in Massachusetts, we've been able to celebrate some major barrier coming down, whether it is in a, city, a municipal election or in a district attorney's race or a con congressional race. and. It, it, at the same time, um, a, a reminder of how long it's taken, how many years before that these barriers and milestones had not had, had still existed and, and had not been reached. Um, when I first ran for city council in 2013, that election year, we doubled the number of women serving on the Boston City Council, a 13 member body. And that year, when I joined, we went from one to two women when I joined then Councilor Ayanna Presley. And when I set out to run, I tried to meet with as many of the wise political heads of Massachusetts and Boston as possible. I did not come from a background with any political connections or knowledge or, or networks. And almost universally, the advice was, this will be impossible. And it was all for reasons given that were outside my control. It right? was Boston doesn't elect some facet of my identity that I was just born with, right? women or Asian Americans or young people or folks who were not born in the city and could trace their family uh, roots generations back. And at a, at a certain level, it was quite demoralizing to hear that across the board, everyone who knew so much about politics had been involved here, thought this would be impossible. And then it was also, at, after I processed it, it became quite liberating because there was nothing I could do to change any of those things. It's not as if I 
would work harder or <laughs> longer. And, and so I ran to give voice to the challenges that my family had experienced. The role that I had taken on as a legal guardian when my mom was first diagnosed with late onset schizophrenia and then re-diagnosed with severe depression with psychosis with similar, all the, the symptoms were the same that um, she became uh, for a while very unable to take care of my younger sisters um, or, or herself. And through that process, navigating a complex school bureaucracy through the public schools or the healthcare system or opening a small business, that is what drove me forward. And it sometimes felt like what I was offering as a, a, a choice in city council or city council president was so different from what had come before that I had the freedom to bring a different kind of leadership because every other way, there was no, there was no way that I matched what had come before. And um, I hope that the progress that we've seen really builds on that sense, that recognition of when we expand the definition of what leadership looks like, you don't have to be born into a political family or one that uh, was born in this country or city or, or spoke English fluently. As long as you bring a drive to do right by your community and to build a, a future that is stronger and more inclusive, in some ways, those barriers are there for, for the taking, uh, for, the, for the taking down. Um, in my career, in, in my role now as mayor, it's striking every day just how ingrained some of the cultural or um, political barriers are. That in fact, in a city with a mecca of higher education and healthcare and resources, we often say we can't. But then when you push and poke at it, it's because we're afraid to, or we haven't done it before, or we don't think it's possible. And so that barrier of believing that it's possible, I think is in some ways our most limiting factor. And it's been quite exciting to see our residents start to believe that city government and government in general can be a, a force for good, a platform for partnership and activism. And that has unlocked worlds in Boston of what we've been able to accomplish. Wow, that is that is fascinating. And, you know, I think about my own children where I always say that whenever they say the words we can't, um, we quickly correct that and say, no, we're going to keep trying. We're going to keep pushing forward. So you can appreciate that. Dr. Murphy, would you also talk with us about your career path to this point? And when you think of challenges, the most significant experiences that come to mind? Yeah, so it, it's interesting, Monica. I think um, sometimes the challenges that are toughest for us may not seem so tough on the outside, or you know, it's a different sometimes on the inside or the outside. One of the toughest challenges I faced in my life was it's going to almost make you laugh because it wasn't really a challenge, but at the time it was crushing to me, which is I didn't get into my top choice of medical school. I remember when I ended up uh, graduating from from college, and I ended up getting into my second choice medical school, uh, and and you know, things turned out okay. You know, I was like, it wasn't like, I, I, but I remember I, I was doing research at Harvard Medical School. Like Michelle, I was an undergrad uh, there and I was doing uh, research at the medical school at undergrad. And I really, really wanted to go to Harvard Medical School. I thought this is a perfect place for me, et cetera. Uh, but I applied and got rejected. And I remember calling my father at the time and I was like really distraught because I was like, you know, the time it's like your world gets so warped into what you think you need to have in order to be successful. Um, that at that time I was, you know, I was 19 years old. I was like, this is exactly what I want to do. And my dream had just been like flushed on the toilet, I felt. Uh, and so my father, I remember he listened to me and he said, he said, Rivik, you know, it's good for you to have a change of institution. You may learn something different if you go to someplace different. And you don't know why this happened. You know, you, there might be a reason that you're being taken down this path. Maybe it's the right path and you wouldn't have taken it if your hand hadn't been forced. Uh, so just approach it with an open mind. Um, and he was right. You know, I ended up going to Yale from a medical school. I had an amazing experience there. I met incredible people. I found it was a very, very different experience than when I was at Harvard. And I, 
um, just the sort of culture, everything was very different in ways that actually suited me quite well. Um, but I never would have had that experience had um, that door not been closed, uh, you know, initially. So that was one of my first sort of experiences that <clears throat> even though it seems like a very small thing from the outside internally, you know, it, it was one of those moments I was like, I had hyped up my expectations of what I thought I should be. Um, and when I couldn't meet those expectations, I was crushed. And I didn't sort of take time to step back and say, hold on, there may be a broader, a deeper message here or another path that I meant to follow. Let me embrace that. Uh, let me view it with openness. And the other thing, uh, the sort of a point I'll just mention that was uh, an inflection point for me, um, but a point of challenge was when I was um, being considered for the position of Surgeon General the first time in the Obama administration. And for all the world, I was like not the expected candidate, right? I was about two and a half decades younger uh, than the, the average like, Surgeon General. I didn't have this like traditional uh, sort of spent years doing academic research, you know, pedigree or, you know, years in a, a specific job. I had, you know, finished my residency training. I was practicing. I was like teaching, but I was also spending half my time building a tech company. I was doing some advocacy work, organizing, you know, uh, community organizing work related to healthcare. I was like, this is like not the traditional sort of like background uh, of, a, of a Surgeon General. And, you know, for many reasons, I was told, yeah, the, just this is like an end of career job. It's not a, you know, where you are job. And so, like, you're just not the right fit uh, for something like this. Um, but I was actually really uh, uh, fortunate that uh, you know, President Obama at that time and his team wanted to actually modernize the office of the Surgeon General. They wanted to think about uh, how we use technology to connect more deeply with the public, how we think about the changing and shifting information environment uh, to manage how we uh, get scientific information out to people who may not always want to, you know, hear it or, or may not encounter it as easily. Um, and so I ended up having this opportunity to serve. But I was also, that that experience made me aware that in life, there's what you do, but there's also luck, right? And, you know, as much as I think, you know, uh, I may, um, you know, can point to moments where, yes, I worked really hard for something. I also know that without uh, without luck, you know, and then sort of the and then fate in the universe, like, you know, all of these opportunities would not have cropped up. But there's a third expense I just share with you that highlighted for me one other thing that's important uh, in addition to hard work and luck. And that was people um, and specifically the people you love. Uh, and this experience actually was shortly after that, about a year after, uh, a few months actually after I was uh, considered for the position of Surgeon General, ultimately the president nominated me. And what they all, what everyone thought would be fairly simple confirmation process turned into uh, a 13 month um, uh, misadventure, if you will. Uh, and it was a, a challenging, uh, you know, your time because, um, it was one of those moments where like, you know, when you're going through confirmation, you can't really say a whole lot publicly, uh, yet you're being talked a lot, uh, you know, talked about a lot publicly and often not in the most positive ways. Um, and I really felt this sense of shame, like I had let down my family and my my friends and my mentors by not being able to sort of get through this process, you know, easily and successfully. And it was becoming a challenge. And very few people thought I would actually make it through confirmation. People gave like a 1% chance of even that of working out. Uh, thankfully, the president uh, never uh, sort of gave up and wanted to keep uh, pressing. And ultimately, uh, you know, through God's grace, I was able to be confirmed. But it was one of those very dark periods in my life where I, I felt very alone and very isolated. Um, and I actually did what you're not supposed to do during those moments, which is I, instead of reaching out to people uh, that I really cared about and who I knew cared about me, I withdrew like more and more and more. Uh, and that just deepened uh, that sense of loneliness and isolation. And it was only really toward the end uh, that I realized that I needed people like more than ever, like in my life. And I, and I sort of, and I realized the lesson that a friend years later ta taught me, which is that so often in life, it's not that we are lacking in friendships. It's that we're not experiencing friendships. Like many of us have people who care about us and love us, um, but we may not reach out to them. We may think that, you know, it's been too long. I don't have time to, you know, to catch up with them. Maybe they don't want to like hear from me or it's so often when we reach out, we find that there's, somebody there who wants to hear from us and who's willing to support us. And I was blessed to find some of those people along the way. But uh, all of those uh, experiences sort of came to teach me that, yes, hard work is important. Yes, having ambition is important. But having a healthy respect for the role of like luck in the universe in these processes and also just knowing how much we all need people, uh, the people we love at various stages of our journey, that, that has remained with me certainly during the second term. Thank you. Um, really great um, discussion of the challenges and how you manage them. I'd like to talk a little bit about a different subject, but one that you've both 
mentioned in your comments thus far. And I also want to invite the audience to send the, to use the send live feedback button that's below the screen if you have questions. And when we um, approach the, toward the end of the conversation, I'd like to bring in some of the questions from the audience. So I encourage you to submit those. I wanna talk a little bit now about, about mental health and, and wellness. And you know, there was a, a 2019 survey on drug use and health, and it found that Asian American and Pacific Islander individuals were less likely to seek mental health care compared to other racial and ethnic groups. And in addition to structural barriers, survey respondents also reported stigma as a notable concern. And when we consider that over the past two plus years with the COVID-19 pandemic, this elevated incidence and prevalence of mental health problems that we've that has been noted widely. Mayor Wu, promoting mental health is among the priorities of your office. Would you share your thoughts about coping with mental health challenges in general, but also among Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander individuals who reported elevated sense of stigma? And any specific suggestions for overcoming the stigma associated with seeking help? I would not be where I am today without the health care that we were able to access in Boston for my mom. And particularly the a moment when I was in law school where it really felt like we had all hit rock bottom. And I remember um, my mom was in the midst of a pretty intense delusion. Um, she had left the, you know, was experiencing um, auditory hallucinations and in the middle of the night was out of uh, her home, sort of knocking on neighbor's doors and, and trying to help, right? But no one else was hearing the things that she was hearing. The police were called. She, you know, we were given the choice. Is she going to the police station or to the hospital? Of course, I begged them to take her to the hospital. And um, she ended up staying inpatient at Mass General for over a week in the psychiatric ward. And that really saved her life. Um, but to get to that point and the tremendous ups and downs, I mean, it had taken years to be able to access the actual treatment and services and healthcare that was a, a direct response to what she needed. And part of that was um, insurance systems and, and trying to find coverage that would connect with the provider who spoke her language and understand the cultural context, a large part of that was shame and stigma, where for the first year of um, what we were experiencing as a family, I barely told anyone. And it took me a long time to even tell my closest friends, to even to reach out, um, as Dr. Murthy was saying, um, because it, it just felt like we had done something wrong. And my mom refused, you know, to this day, still has a hard time talking about this as a mental health challenge, right? So I think we're, as a society, trained so much to speak openly about physical ailments, but then if something is sort of above the neck, um, it's, it, it's then connected to your character or your, your strength or your will or your, your, your being. Um, and I, we, we've seen this documented in data too. There are researchers in Boston who do work specifically on stigma who have shared with me that, and, you know, in fact, the research shows that disparities in terms of life expectancy have narrowed across almost any way you could cut, count them over the last 20 years. There's still tremendous disparities that we need to address, but they have narrowed in many ways. But one way in which they haven't narrowed is for individuals living with schizophrenia, that the life expectancy remain has for 20 years, even as medical treatment has improved, even as the the learnings that our healthcare community has developed have deepened that in fact stigma is so deeply rooted in an in individual's ability and, and willingness to access care and in society's response when they are in those moments that um, it can be in some ways quite off-putting when you actually do end up in, in those spaces where care is administered because you feel so invisible. And we had had many experiences prior to being at Mass General where as a, an immigrant who um, didn't always speak English fluently and certainly with an accent, 
I saw my mom dehumanized in many spaces where we were there specifically to reach out and get help. And so across the city, we know that the need is growing. I hear from every touch point of city government that, you know, whether it's crisis calls coming in through 911, the frequency and intensity of mental health being very much intertwined with those calls, or if you ask any school nurse in Boston and, and beyond, I, I assume, the wait lists for mental health care for our young people and the depth of need from students who have experienced so much in their families throughout the pandemic, our seniors who have faced grief and isolation and anxiety, this is really going to be a, a, the epidemic after the pandemic. And we are trying to do our best in Boston to use federal funds that we have, the American Rescue Plan dollars, the ARPA funds, to change systems as well. So we're dedicating a chunk of our federal recovery funds to try to build the infrastructure in the workforce. There are vacancies and shortages in staffing across the board in almost any industry, but particularly when it comes to mental health care and health care for providers of color, for multilingual providers, it's not enough just to have services available, to really feel seen and connected and able to access them. Our communities have to see providers who look like them, who understand and come from our communities. And so we're looking to launch an initiative that would partner with local healthcare institutions to recruit, train, and then directly connect providers of color and clinicians who are multilingual to our local healthcare centers, our hospitals, community health centers, and hopefully then change the capacity of our systems to be responsive. I think that's fantastic that you're working on these areas and changing systems of care to address the issues that you, that you talked about um, in terms of accessing culturally appropriate care and the experience of dehumanization in settings when care is sought, the challenges to receiving care, and then of course the importance of diversifying the workforce. And I just want to say that I, I do wish your mom all the best, because I know that the journey of dealing with mental health challenges um, is can be lifelong, depending on what the condition is, but I do wish her the best. Um, Dr. Murphy, let, let's talk a little bit about an area that we know is important to you and that you've written extensively about. And you talked about this a little earlier in terms of your own experience, the, the crisis of loneliness and social isolation and in fact, an excellent book that you authored uh, called Together, The Healing Power of Human Connection in a Sometimes Lonely World focuses on this very topic. And we know that social isolation or feelings of loneliness can put a person's physical and mental health at, at risk. So what are some of the key considerations that you would offer for addressing social isolation for both youth and older adults? And are there any culturally specific considerations that we should know? Yeah, thanks, Monica. And um, let me just say one thing, uh, just reflect on Mayor Wu's uh, story about like, how powerful it is that she shared so openly about her mother's struggles and, and about the role that she played in addressing those. One of the things that has, I think, allowed this stigma around mental health, especially in API communities, to uh, sort of continue and to uh, persist is that uh, is that we don't have enough people actually sharing stories. And so it seems like these are isolated challenges and people continue to, you know, glance at you like something may be wrong with you or your family. I mean, it's really, that's how we felt when I lost an uncle to suicide. I was in high school, uh, like just this real sense of shame and awkwardness around telling people. Um, but when people step up and share those stories, it really pulls back the curtain on something that is impacting all of us in some way and all of our families directly or indirectly which are these mental health challenges. So I, I just want to acknowledge just how powerful uh, what Mayor Wu has done, not just in this conversation, but even before, in sharing about her family's experiences. Um, you know, I think the issue of loneliness and social connection is deeply tied uh, to what we're seeing with mental health, because what Mayor Wu described in terms of like what school counselors were telling us, uh, both in Boston, but all around the country, what um, clinicians and hospitals are telling us, what parents, you know, are telling us, is very consistent, which is that, there is a worsening mental health crisis. We had a mental health crisis before the pandemic, just to be 100% clear. Anxiety, depression rates were increasing. Uh, if we look at kids in particular, we had a 57% increase in the suicide rate in the decade prior to the pandemic among kids, right? We saw, again, anxiety and depression levels rise. We saw 
that loneliness levels, particularly among young people, uh, are really at extraordinarily high levels. There are more people, adults in our country who struggle with loneliness than who have diabetes. Yet think about how much attention and focus we put on one versus the other. Uh, it's not that we need less focus on diabetes, it's that we need more focus on, on how to really build social connection and community. Uh, and so when I think about the mental health crisis, I think that there are at least three big factors that are happening. One is that um, we have a series of crises uh, that people are facing, which I think are diminishing their hope for the present and the future, but also causing them to experience loss. The pandemic is one of those, right? How many of us lost people that we love uh, during this pandemic? Nearly one million. Uh, Americans, but it wasn't even just the loss of lives. It was a loss of jobs for many people, the loss of education for many kids, the loss of opportunities to see uh, family and friends during the last two years. Um, so you put those crises together with climate change, racism, and other uh, challenges that people are facing. And for many young people that I talk to across the country when we do roundtables, they they ask the question, is the future really brighter uh, than the past? Uh, when they, you know, because they're looking at these challenges and wondering. But the second factor actually is, um, you know, we have to think about is our social connection. We know that for decades, um, this has been documented by Bob Putnam over at Harvard and others, but there has been a decline uh, over the last five, six decades in, this, you know, people's participation in social organizations and community and in social capital. Uh, and, you know, that's manifesting in physical and mental health consequences. Uh, you add all of this, you know, on top of technology, and you, which is, you know, is very helpful to some people, but can also uh, adversely impact people's social connection relationships uh, in other circumstances. And you have a perfect storm for, I think, you know, at least some factors that are driving the broader challenges that we're seeing with. Uh, with mental health. But if we really want to address our mental health challenges and more broadly, if we want to think about how to uh, impact how people perform in the workplace, how our kids do in school, how our neighborhoods function, we do believe that we have to think about how to rebuild social connection and community. This isn't something we talk about very often because to say that you're lonely is like saying that you're not likable to many people, to saying that you're uh, somehow not lovable, uh, even worse. Uh, and, you know, I say this as somebody who struggled with loneliness for years, especially as a child. I never told my parents, even though uh, I knew they loved me unconditionally, uh, even though I knew they wouldn't judge me, but I just felt this profound shame at saying that I was like really lonely in school. And it's because I was really shy and I had a hard time making friends, uh, even though I really wanted to hang out with other kids. I didn't realize at the time that I wasn't the only one. Like years later, of course, now I talk to classmates and they're like, oh yeah, I felt that way too. I'm like, God, we never knew that each other were, like we were all struggling uh, with this. But there are so many people struggling with loneliness um, in isolation. So I think if we want to address this, I think there are a couple of key things we've got to do. Number one, we have to we have to talk about it and help people recognize that this is not evidence that you're broken. Loneliness is a signal like hunger or thirst that tells us we're lacking something we need for survival. And that is our human connections. And so no more reason to feel ashamed if you're lonely than if you're hungry. Uh, the question, the second thing we've got to think about is how do we help people actually strengthen and build connection in our life? And I think part of this actually is a cultural challenge, right? Like if we think about it, much of modern society is a work-centered society. If I, when I finished my training at Brigham Women's Hospital back in the day, if I said, you know, I'm going to leave and I'm going to go to a small town uh, in America where I don't know anybody, I have no connections, but they're going to make me the the chair of the Department of Medicine. Imagine that, straight out of training, the chair of the Department of Medicine. And people would have applauded and said, wow, the Vakes would really have taken his career seriously. He's got this amazing opportunity, good for him. And on the other hand, if I said, you know what, I'm moving to a small town in America because my family is there and my friends are there and I grew up there. I actually don't have a job. I'm going to try to get there and figure it out somehow. I don't know what the opportunities will be, but I'm going to move there because of my family. I know what the whispers would have been. It would have been like, you know, he was really ambitious. He had such high prospects. And I guess he just lost his ambition. Uh, who knows what's going on? Um, that is reflective of a society that is very much centered around work, right? Um, there's nothing wrong with work. You know, work gives us purpose. and allows us to contribute to society. It allows us to earn, uh, you know, a, a living wage, hopefully, that can support our family and our friends. But in life, you know, we have to prioritize, right? And I've realized the hard way that even though I've always prioritized people in my life, the reality is that I was putting work ahead of people for much of my life. And I came to see that very clearly during the pandemic. So I think the cultural challenge we have is how do we rebuild a people-centered society, a relationship-centered society where uh, workplaces actually create the kind of flexibility uh, for workers so that they can actually be there for their families during times of need because our relationships really do matter. We're where schools give young people tools for building healthy relationships uh, from an early age and see that just as important as the skills we give them in reading and writing, 
because that is going to help them build uh, relationships that will sustain them uh, in the long term. And, and as a government, how do we also invest here, not just in the research, you know, that we need to develop better and better ways to strengthen the community, but also uh, in identifying this as a priority and bringing stakeholders together to develop uh, a national or regional local strategy for how we're going to strengthen connection in our neighborhood. Uh, we are actually right now working with the U.S. Conference of Mayors and, and, and other elected leaders around the country to, to think about how to build an agenda around connection and community as we come through this pandemic, realizing it's got to be part of what we do to help learn from the pandemic and strengthen ourselves, not just for the next pandemic, for other challenges that may come our way. So and this issue is one that's very near and dear to my heart. I see it as the foundation, as, as an effort to rebuild the foundation of our country. If that foundation is strong, then we have you know, healthy schools, we have workplaces where people are more productive and creative, we have people who are healthier and physically and mentally, uh, and we have communities which are more tightly connected to one another. We came together at the beginning of this pandemic, but then we splintered, right? Uh, in many ways as a country, as a pandemic persisted. Um, and if you look at the countries that did really well around the world, it wasn't the countries that had the most money, it was actually the countries that had the most trust between individuals, the most connection uh, between individuals and their government. So that is what we have to rebuild. That's why I see it as not just critical for health, but really critical for the functioning of society. And it's why we're launching, uh, you know, in the near future, a broader initiative around connection and community for the country. Connection and community. I love it. Um, you know, I'd like to ask just one more question that I'm going to direct at Mayor Wu. And then I'd like to turn over. We have a very active audience who is sending in lots of comments and questions, and I'd like to try to get to as many of them as we can. But I'd like to ask you, Mayor Wu, about a topic that is you know, near and dear to what we are focused on at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and that's addressing health disparities and advancing health equity. And you know, I've been delighted to learn more about your office and, and you've expressed your commitment to ending disparities in healthcare access and outcomes. And your office is focused on long-standing as well as new health disparities that we know are caused by multiple factors. Um, and so can you talk about some of the issues that you're focused on and some of the strategies your office has taken or is planning to take um, and what one can do to address discrimination and reduce health disparities? So our starting point is a health in all approach. And I'm so grateful that the person leading the charge for the city who I just follow her lead is Dr. Basola Ojukutu, who is the director of the Boston Public Health Commission. Uh, previously, this had been a, a role that was in some ways insulated from the city and layered with, with different bureaucratic uh, spaces in between. But one of the first things that I did is coming into office in the middle of the pandemic as well was to clear that away and ask Dr. Ojukutu directly to serve in our cabinet to be that voice of public health for the city of Boston. And so through her leadership and her teams, we've been trying to not just put band-aids on issues stemming from COVID-19 and the pandemic, but to really lay a foundation for all of the targeted interventions, programs and services that were needed long before this virus that are directly ex exacerbating disparities. One strategy is to ensure that we are working and partnering directly with community organizations because at the end of the day, the city can provide that outreach. We can, we can look to make connections. We can open up testing centers or walk-in sites for vaccination. But the most that could move the needle in Boston was always when we deferred to local community organizations, grassroots leaders, and, and organiza organizations who already had the relationships to be able to reach people directly. And so having building that sense of community and trust and, and working directly with those who have been on the ground and in the field for years is key. We're also looking to make sure that as we think about all aspects of policy, whether it's housing in the city of Boston or public safety or um, the, the approach to how we are planning for our education system to recover, that the connection and intersection with public health is really elevated in all of those conversations. Great, thank you. So there are a number of comments uh, that have come in and, and questions, and, and I know that what you are sharing is really resonating with people. How do I know? Well, I'll give you one example. So someone writes, only a compliment. I, I, I consider it rare and very important for a person who's had 
great success to acknowledge that luck plays a role. And I only wanted to say thank you to Vivek Murphy for saying that and for modeling great leadership to such a large group. Um, so let me ask a question. There are a couple of questions that have come in um, where our audience is interested in your advice as it relates to, um, as it relates to career. So I'd like to ask those questions and, and either of you um, feel free to chime in. Um, one of the questions is due to experiences with discrimination and racism, I grew up passionate about my identity as an Asian American woman. As a result of speaking up about diversity issues, I'm also labeled as the token Asian or I'm expected to be an expert on all Asian American issues. Although this can be quite intimidating, I still want to continue being involved in diversity initiatives. What advice would you have for someone who is a young Asian American professional starting off their career in public service? Dr. Murthy, you, you go ahead first. Oh, sure, sure. Well, well, first of all, I'm so glad that you're asking the question because I, I do think what you're representing is the fact that all of our voices actually really do matter here when it comes to uh, making sure uh, that America is a home for every group, including AAPIs. And I think that there's a lot that each of us can do. Like if you are, for example, at NIH and there are groups, uh, AAPI groups that are helping to advance the participation of AAPIs uh, in various aspects of research for the NIH community or that are looking to help represent uh, more about the API community to the broader NIH community. Um, those are good groups, I think, to be a part of and to lend your voice to. Uh, I also think it's important, like in the spheres that we occupy, whether that's our own working group and working division, or whether it's a broader agency that we're a part of, to think about how we can contribute from our own shared, ex our own experience and our unique experience. We don't have to speak for every, uh, you know, member of the Asian American and, uh, you know, Pacific Islander Native Hawaiian community, but we can help people learn uh, about our own experiences and broaden their understanding of the API community. And so sometimes I know that, um, especially if you've experienced, it sounds like racism and discrimination as you have, and I know many of us have, sometimes the, the instinct can be to hold some of that back. But I actually think that in these moments to be able to share more and help people understand uh, us and our community is, is actually vital. And the last thing I'll say is to lend your support to other members of the API community, because I do think that uh, this is a time where, look, all of us are, none of us are ever enough all the time, but together we can be enough, you know, all of the time. And that requires us uh, being there for one another, reaching out proactively to support uh, one another. Like, you know, given, you never know from the outside if people are having a tough time because uh, we live in a society that tells us you, we should like gloss it all over uh, and look like, you know, we've got everything together, whether it's in real life or on Instagram or wherever it is. Uh, and the, so checking in, you know, on, you know, your fellow API community members is important uh, to see how are you doing, especially, you know, during this pandemic, this is a time where hate crimes against uh, members of our community uh, skyrocketed, right? And many people had family members who were impacted. And many people felt like they were looked at differently uh, as they walked through uh, the, the town and through neighborhoods. Um, so this is a time where I think proactively checking on one another, having spaces to actually talk about how the, that what's happening in the world is affecting us and affecting our community. That is so, so important uh, because otherwise, like most people don't always have spaces where they can talk openly uh, about how world events and especially, you know, you know, the experience of racism is impacting them. So just a few thoughts, but let me turn it to Mayor Wu. I'm sure she has much better suggestions for you. <laughs> no, I was I was going to start by saying I understand and hear that frustration. I have lived it and in Boston, well, I, I guess nationally, I, I was told um, in the course of my election as mayor that if you count all of the largest cities in this country, very, very few have ever had an Asian American mayor, and the vast majority of those who have have been Asian American men in those roles. And so in some ways, it's still new for us as a country to see Asian Americans in, in certain leadership roles. And uh, we are working diligently and with hopeful determination to keep building that pipeline and boost that visibility. Uh, but I am only the second ever Asian American to serve in Boston city government at all, ever. Uh, Sam Yoon had been elected to the city council from and served from 2005 to 2009, and I'm the only other Asian American who's ever served. Um, and so it was a very frequent experience where any issue that came up around foreign policy related to an Asian country or, or anything else, people sort of turned to me and say, well, um, and it was many moments and opportunities for education. 
So I think uh, one point I want to make is that, as Dr. Murthy said, encouraging and building the pipeline and reaching out to other Asian Americans to boost our leadership and visibility. When you do hit a tipping point, it is it is transformative. Uh, when I first joined the council, there were only two women out of 13 and everything was about the women counselors, right? What were we doing? What were we plotting together? And were we voting the same way? Were we voting different, differently? The next election cycle, two more women were elected, but even then it was, okay, all the four women counselors are standing together, what's happening? It wasn't until there were six women out of 13 serving that since then, and now, now today we're at a majority of the council women and people of color, um, you don't hear the term woman counselor anymore because it's just expected and, and standard. And so for those who are breaking down barriers and blazing trails, it can be um, a, a, a blessing, but also an, a tremendous responsibility and burden at times to bear that, that sort of headway that, that you're making. Um, I think for me also um, one bit, you know, depending, uh, this might apply across industries, is to think about building those opportunities for education and coalition building outside of times of crisis as well. It's one thing to feel like no one's going to speak up when there's a tense moment except for you, and then you're always put in that role. And there's another thing to, it's another thing to work with the larger organization or agency to plan for the, the chance outside of those urgent tense moments to have real conversations about what it means to have a API culture and leadership celebrated to highlight the common struggles that our community has had with alongside of, and in solidarity with other communities so that in those tense moments and in those emergency crises or conflicts there's a different context to those relationships that you have backing you up. Wow you know we have so many questions and comments, and I realize that our time is short, and I want to be mindful of that. So uh, to the audience, I want to thank you for sending those questions in. I won't be able to get all of them in. I would like to um, just offer an opportunity for you to share anything else to help, you know, any lessons learned or any ideas to help inspire the next generation as we close, uh, as we close today's conversation. Would well, either of you... Yes, I'll just jump in and say thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is a, a joy and an inspiration to be able to look and see Dr. Murthy in, in your leadership role. And thank you, Monica, for so skillfully moderating uh, and, and for all that you do in your role every day. Um, you know, I think for a long time, I felt like raising my hand for a leadership role in some ways meant I had to go against or unlearn sort of habits and, and, and how I was raised, right? To be, when I was growing up, the, the highest praise that my parents could give me was that I was Hengui, which translates to sort of a, there's connotations of respectful, obedient, right? But not rocking the boat. Um, and politics sometimes feels like the opposite of that, where you have to defend your viewpoint, get in there and, and lead. But in fact, um, I realized that I was as boxed in in how I was thinking about leadership and who has the capacity and ability to lead as all those who had come before me. And in fact, the cultural values that so many Asian American families um, and, and sort of first generation uh, children have been raised with in immigrant families are the exact values that we want in public service of a connection to community and uh, reverence and appreciation for history and the greater good and your role in working hard to make that happen. And so I, I hope and um, encourage everyone to lean into what makes you authentically you, your identity, your culture, your family, your relationships. And to when you're faced with that prospect of do you reach out for that next opportunity to think of it not so much as are you personally as ready as you could be for that because chances are you you probably are putting too much expectation on yourself and just say well I need more experience I need more time etc instead think of it outside your own body right think of it as who will represent your community if you're not at that table and how many people will be missing out on your leadership if you're not offering it we're in a very urgent moment in our society in our country's political history and in the planet's 
history right now. And so we need everyone who can possibly lead to step up and offer that leadership. We need to build a society where we can see what's possible and, and trust in each other to work together to get there. And I'm so honored to be partnering with those um, in posts in this administration and around the city and country to do our part and hope that we can make a difference as we look to pass down this world to our, our kids and grandkids after that. But thank you so much for having me. Happy APA Heritage Month. Well, well we, are, we are at two o'clock, Dr. Murphy. So then I'll just keep on brief and just say a thank you again to Mayor Wu for being the inspiring leader that you are, for giving so many of us hope, and to Monica, to Rina, to the whole team, uh, and Eliseo at the NIMH, who have uh, really helped make this extra series a reality. Um, I just want to end by saying, look, the AAPI community is a vital part of America, and that means that if you are part of that community, you too are a vital part of America. We want people to know that. And as Mayor Wu was saying, this is a time where the nation needs uh, AAPI leaders uh, to step up in various capacities. And a leader could mean that you lead an agency or an effort uh, you know, within NIH. It could mean that you run for office. It could mean that you take a lead role in bringing your community together to create a space where they can talk and be together and support one another. There are many ways to lead uh, right now, but just know that your voice and your leadership are more important than ever before. And finally, I would just say with everything happening in the world right now, please also do take some moments to take care of yourself, to take care of your family uh, and your loved ones. Um, you know, this is not a short sprint that we're in the middle of. This is a marathon. You know, the country's going to need API engagement and leaders for years and years to come. There's an urgency to now, but we also want you to be able to sustain that engagement for the future. So take those moments, take care of yourself and know that you are a vital part of America and your voice is more needed than ever. So, so appreciate you for doing this and happy API uh, Heritage Month. Um, Eliseo, I give you one moment. I just want to, before you close us out, personally thank both of you for really fascinating and thought provoking conversation. And on behalf of the organizers of this event, the planning committee at the NIH, uh, the Federal Asian Pacific American Council, the chapter, um, and the other AAPI groups at sister federal agencies from FDA, CDC, HRSA, who worked really hard to put this event together. And I know that you are both so busy, and so we are appreciative that you've taken time to be with us today. Dr. Perez Estable. Thank you so much, Monica, for again moderating this in a magnificent way. And Vivek, it was great to see you again. And uh, uh, Mayor Wu, I hope to meet you sometime and when I go to Boston sometime later this year. So thanks everyone for attending. Thank you so much. Thanks Thank so you. much, everyone.